Sir Isaac Newton is famous for his many contributions he's made to the world. He invented the reflecting telescope. He proposed the theory of light and color. He invented calculus, to which a lot of high school students are saying thanks a lot. He advanced modern chemistry, and he described the three laws of motion. One of his teachings is called the Arc of Descent. It's about kinetics, velocity, inertia of falling persons and things. It says once a descending object acquires a certain momentum, it continues on a downward curve to eventually impact with an immovable object at the bottom, thereby fulfilling the arc of descent. To put it in plain English, things on a downward spiral usually keep getting worse and worse, unless something or someone intervenes. In the northern ten tribes of Israel, this proved to be true. Ever since their first king, Jeroboam, he made those two golden calves, put them up in Dan and Bethel to keep the people from going south to worship in Jerusalem, things got progressively worse from Jeroboam. I mean, when you think of Ahab and Jezebel and all their wickedness, that was not rock bottom. It only got worse. And it was actually culm culminated in a young man named Hoshea. Hoshea would end up being the last king that the ten tribes in the north ever had. And somehow, some way, he managed to top all of the evil that the previous kings had achieved. In 2 Kings 17.2, he says, And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, yet not as the kings of Israel who were before him. That's bad when you're so wicked that none of the previous heathens can compare with the things that you've done. His behavior was the straw that broke the camel's back. God had had enough, and he sent Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, to end the madness. Assyria invaded all of the land, all of northern Israel, and then finally surrounded and besieged the capital city of Samaria. They was under siege for over three years. Just imagine for a moment that your city was cut off from the rest of the world for three years. There's no food deliveries, no medical supplies, no visitors, no fuel, nothing. And once you used up your stored resources, you were finished. Samaria had managed to survive an impressive three years, but it finally fell. And the area into the north ceased to be called Israel any longer. It still kept the name Samaria after the capital city. And this was all because the people that God had given the land to had disobeyed him. They followed false gods and they followed idols. So God sent this judgment upon them. Now, lest anybody think for a minute that Assyria did this by their own military might or that Assyria might be superior to God, look at what happens next in 2 Kings 17, it's, and starting in verse 24. And the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, Sepharvaim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the people of Israel. Israel, and they took possession of Samaria and lived in its cities. And at the beginning of their dwelling there, they did not fear the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. So the king of Assyria was told, The nations that you have carried away and placed in the cities of Samaria do not know the law of the God of the land. Therefore he has sent lions among them, and behold, they are killing them, because they do not know the law of the God of the land. Then the king of Assyria commanded, Send there one of the priests whom you carried away from there, and let him go and dwell there and teach them the law of the God of the land. So they did, but there was one problem. This priest had failed to mention that God is a jealous God, and he is the one true God, the only true God. The inhabitants feared the Lord and worshipped him, but they also kept their gods and their idols as well. But God made it clear that day that he is still in control, regardless of who occupied the territory. Now, the whole time the northern tribes were sinning with their idols, Judah down in the south had begun doing the same thing. But when the north had completed their arc of descent and hit rock bottom, the kingdom of Judah made a 180-degree turn backwards towards obedience. 
Rarely does such a destructive pattern of behavior make an abrupt about face as Judah did when Hezekiah became their king. In 2 Kings 18 verses 4 and 5, it tells of Hezekiah's actions. It says, He removes the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah. He broke into pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord. Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. This is the exact opposite of the epitaph of Hoshea of northern Israel. He had done so much evil, no other king had done as much as him. And then we have Hezekiah. He has done so much well. There was none like him before him and none like him after him. He tore down all of the idols. He cut down all the Asherah poles. Did you catch that part in 18.4? That he had broke apart the pieces of the bronze serpent that Moses had made. Way back in Numbers 21, when this serpent was made, while they had been freed from Egypt and were wandering in the wilderness, they had kept this thing and they had worshipped it. And Hezekiah said, no more, and he destroyed it. Hezekiah refused to pay the silver and gold for a tribute to Assyria like all the other nations. Assyria would threaten them and bully them, and it would take a bribe or a payment to leave them alone. Well, Hezekiah defied Shalmaneser, who was king of Assyria at the time. He's the king that conquered the north. Hezekiah was even successful in driving all of the Philistines out of their land. But sometimes when everything's going well and good, we have a habit of getting a case of the big head. That's when the trials and times of testing come your way. And it's in those times that you can choose to either rely on yourself and your own strength, or you can rely on God. Ten years after he defied Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, a new king of Assyria is on the throne, and he is on a conquering spree. This king's name is Sennacherib. Now, he's off presently at this time with the scripture. He's off on another battle, and his goal is to head to Egypt and conquer it. And he has the full capability of conquering that powerful nation. But while he's on the way, he decides to go ahead and begin taking the nation of Judah while he just happens to be passing through. For some reason, God allows him a small degree of success. Assyria overpowers some of the fortified cities that lay on the borders of Judah. Now the enemy nation who had taken away their brothers to the north were now in their front yard. And this is where we see a moment of weakness in this godly man, Hezekiah. But the Bible never sugarcoats or waters down anything that they do. They paint a person's portrait complete, warts and all. 2 Kings in 18, starting in verse 14, And Hezekiah king of Judah sent to the king of Assyria at Lachish, saying, I have done wrong. Withdraw from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will bear. And the king of Assyria required of Hezekiah king of Judah... 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. And Hezekiah gave him all of the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house. At that time, Hezekiah stripped the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the doorpost that Hezekiah king of Judah had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. Why do kings always rob the temple when it comes to paying off and bribing enemy nations? Have you ever noticed that trend? They always take the gold and the silver and everything from the temple treasury. Could you imagine being the worker who is ordered to go and scrape the gold off of the doors in the house of the Lord? I would be afraid I'd be struck by lightning. The other problem you have with paying off the enemy besides showing a lack of faith in God's deliverance is the enemy will never be satisfied. He is a bully. He's always going to want more and more. And once he sees he can get away with it, he will continue. Assyria took all of the silver and gold that Hezekiah gave them from not only from the Lord's temple, but also from the king's treasury. And they still sent messengers to demand a surrender. They had told the people, well, you can stay here in your own places, drink from your own cisterns until we get done with this other war, and then we'll come and take you and move you off to another place, but you'll live. 
Now, this is where we pick up in today's verses. But in the previous chapter in 18, these men were there earlier taunting with a series of, uh, of taunts and teases to the people that were within the city. They asked the people of Judah, what makes you think you have any chance of winning? Look at the Assyrian army. Look at what we've done. The messengers ask, is it Egypt that you're going to depend upon? And they mention that they plan on conquering them next anyway. Then the messengers mocked the military strength and the size of the forces of Judah. In 2 Kings 18, 23, they said, Come now, take a wager with my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you 2,000 horses if you're able on your part to put riders on them. You know, they're willing to spot Judah's army, 2,000 horses, in an attempt to level the playing field and make it more of a challenge if they have enough men to sit upon it. You know, then this great force of Assyria, they bite off more than they can chew. And as some old timers say, their alligator mouth is about to overload their grasshopper rear ends. They turn not only to mocking God, but to lying about him. 2 Kings 18.25 Moreover, it is without the Lord, is it without the Lord that I have come up against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Wow. Not only lying about God, but taking credit for the things that he's about to do. And it says the king was greatly troubled over these words. He had sent men over to the prophet Isaiah to inquire of the Lord. Now he's getting on the right track again. Not taking money and sending it to Assyria, but going to God like he should have done in the first place. And Isaiah tells him not to worry about what these guys are saying. To paraphrase it, God's got this. But those pesky messengers come back again, and they start in with another wave of taunts and threats. And it begins in verses 10 through 13 of 2 Kings 19. Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah. Do not let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you by promising that Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands, devoting them to destruction. And shall you be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them, the nations that my fathers destroyed, Gozan, Haran, Rezeph, and the people of Eden who were in Telassar? Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of Sepharvaim, the king of Hena, the king of Eva? The messengers, they didn't just go directly to King Hezekiah. They shouted it out for all the people who were sitting on the walls to hear. This instilled a sense of fear among the people within the city. The last time the messengers had done this, Hezekiah's men tried to get them to say these things in a different language so the people wouldn't become alarmed. Back in chapter 18, verse 26, Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and Shebna, and Joah, said to Rabshakeh, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it. Do not speak to us in the language of Judah within the hearing of the people who were on the wall. But Rabshakeh said to him, Has my master sent me to speak these words to your master and to you, and not to the men sitting on the wall who were doomed with you to eat their own dung and drink their own urine? Yuck. Here was a threat of a coming siege, just like they succeeded in doing to Samaria. And remember when they seized Samaria, I mean, people were buying donkeys' heads for so much. They were buying doves' dung. The people just do what they can when the food shelves go empty. And then the guy continued, the messenger, Then Rabshakeh stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. And they just went on spouting these same things over and over again that we just read about. They cited that all of the gods of the other nations were unable to protect them against Assyria. Well, duh. They're carved images of wood and metal and stone. They're things, objects, made with human hands. They're not going to deliver anything. They can't deliver themselves. But now Assyria is going up against the one true and living God. So the mockers mocked as they do best. They gave all of the people an earful and sent over a letter saying the same thing addressed to Hezekiah personally. This way the messengers couldn't change anything or they couldn't sugarcoat it. Everything that they just said to the people, Hezekiah was about to read in this letter. 
We'll see his reaction in chapter 19, starting in verse 14. Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, the God of Israel, who is enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, of all kingdoms of earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear the the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria had laid waste to the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they were destroyed. So now, O Lord our God, save us, please, from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. Now Hezekiah is doing the right thing, something he should have done before robbing the temple and scraping the gold off of the doors. He went straight to the Lord and literally laid out the problem before him in prayer. He just spread out the letter and prayed over it. Let that be a lesson for you today. If you remember nothing else from today's study, remember this. Going to God in prayer should be the first step you take, the number one thing. Don't try to solve it on your own. Don't try to throw money at the problem. Don't scrape gold off of a door or rob something to try to pay off. Too often, we tend to have the attitude that says, well, I've done everything that I can do. There's nothing left to do now except pray. No, prayer should be the very first thing we do when we face any problem, no matter how big the problem is, no matter how small the problem is. Go to the Lord first. So in his prayer, Hezekiah acknowledges that Assyria has indeed conquered many nations, as they boasted about, and God already knew this. The nation of Assyria was his instrument of judgment against the rebellious northern kingdom. God had allowed them to be taken captive. But be careful here that we don't blame God for what happened. Too many times, God gets the blame for things that he had absolutely nothing to do with. The ten tribes in the north, they had sinned repeatedly for hundreds of years. And all during that time, God sent prophet after prophet begging them to stop their sinful ways to repent. Back in 2 Kings 17, verses 13 and 14, Yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah by every prophet and every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways, and keep my commandments and my statutes in accordance with all the law that I have commanded your fathers, and that I sent to you by my servants the prophets. But they would not listen but were stubborn, as their fathers had been, who did not believe in the Lord their God. You know, our God is the God of second chances, and third chances, and fourth chances, but he can, you can only continue in rebellion so long before his patience finally runs out. You know, some people don't struggle to understand why God allowed such wicked nations like Assyria, Babylon, Philistia, and even Rome during the time of Christ, why he would allow them to bring his judgment against his chosen people. Even though God had lovingly warned them many, many times to stop it, he allowed them to be taken. Well, you see, God in his perfect holiness, he cannot allow sin to go unpunished. If he did, he would no longer be holy. He would no longer be just. So instead of endorsing the evil acts against his people, he merely withdrew his divine protection from them. He let the wicked nations continue being wicked by themselves and the other people reaping their own consequences for their actions. So in response to Hezekiah's prayer, while the king is still pouring his heart out before the Lord, God God speaks to the prophet Isaiah. In 2 Kings 19.20, it says, Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Your prayer to me about Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, I have heard. You know, since God had allowed Assyria to have so many victories, Assyria began to think that they were invincible. And since they defeated Samaria and Israel and a few outposts around Judah, they now believed that they were superior to Israel's God. And now God has has just a few things to say about that, beginning in verse 22 of chapter 19. Whom have you mocked and reviled? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted your eyes to the heights? Against the Holy One of Israel. By your messengers you have mocked the Lord, and you have said, With my many chariots I've gone up to the heights of the mountains, to the far recesses of Lebanon. I've felled its tallest cedars, its choicest cypress. I've entered into its farthest lodging place, its most fruitful forest. 
forest. I dug wells and drank foreign waters. I dried up with the sole of my foot all the streams of Egypt. Have you not heard that I determined it long ago? I planned from days of old what I now bring to pass, that you should turn fortified cities into heaps of ruin. You know, God had long ago ordained that this was going to happen, that Assyria was going to take over the northern kingdom. And he has sent prophets all throughout the rest of the remaining years on the lower kingdom of Judah, telling them that Babylon will take them away. And it did come to happen. But back to Assyria, in Second Kings nineteen twenty-seven and 28, the Lord continues his rant against Assyria. He says, but I know you're sitting down and you're going out and you're coming in and you're raging against me because you have raged against me and your complacency has come into my ears I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth and I will turn you back on the way by which you came that alligator mouth of Assyrius has gone and bit off more than its grasshopper booty can handle now we'll pick up in verses 32 through 34 Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city or shoot an arrow there or come before it with a shield or cast up a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same he shall return and he shall not come into this city, declares the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. Here we have just been given the divine promise of protection against Assyria by God. God. Now let's see that promise put into action in verses 35 through 37. And that night the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went home and lived in Nineveh. And as he was worshipping in the house of Nisroch, his god, Adramelech and Sherezer, his sons, struck him down with the sword and escaped into the land of Ararat. And Ishar Haddon, his son, reigned in his place. The supposedly unbeatable nation was brought to its knees. This was only possible with God. Until then, they had been unstoppable. Back in the beginning of their history, Tiglath-Pileser began to rule around 1100 BC. He had beat the Babylonians. He had beat the Syrians. Had a total of 42 kings and nations he had wiped out. And this was just their first ruler. It continued on through each successive king. Now, with all the spoils of battle that they had looted, they built great cities like Nineveh and Kalah. These two cities had palaces that spanned several acres. I'm not talking about square footage of a building. We're talking about acreage. And it was during the peak of Assyrian rule that glass making came to be. There was the invention of the game of backgammon. And among those were the invention of the lock and key the art of therapeutic massage, and all of these things come from Assyria during their peak. But their glory did not last very long. They were greatly humbled at this point, and they continued their arc of descent all the way to the bottom, just like the northern kingdom it did. There was fighting between King Assurbanipal and his brother that weakened the empire, and it made it vulnerable to outside invaders. Finally, in 612 B.C., the Medes from the Iranian plateau and the Chaldeans from Babylon rose up and ultimately decimated Assyria. It never rose again. And just 25 short years after that, Babylon was allowed to bring the disobedient nation of Judah to its end after centuries of warnings and even watching their brothers in the north being carried into exile. God is so patient and long-suffering with us, but even His patience has limits. He gives us chance after chance, multiple opportunities to make the choice of either trusting and obeying Him or rejecting Him. Every single person with the ability to tell right from wrong has to make that decision. If you are wise, you will not put it off for too long, because one day the limit of that patience will be exceeded, and our time will be up. When that final buzzer sounds and our journey on this old ball of mud is over, 
The door is closed forever on the ability to make that decision. And unless we invite God to intervene and change us, as he did in the nation of Judah with King Hezekiah, we're going to inevitably complete the arc of descent that has gained momentum as we lived our entire lives in sin. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall.